All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Council uh, North Bluewortha. It's August 13th, 930 a.m. And uh, welcome to those folks that are joining us live here in the chambers, as well as those that may be joining us virtually online. And as most folks do know, we do have a YouTube channel and we record our meetings and we upload them to our YouTube channel. So just a reminder that any comments um, or opinions that are expressed will be recorded and available to the public. Uh, to view or to hear as well. And before we get into our business, Council would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, in particular, our neighbors from Fort Anishinaabe and Curve Lake First Nations. We recognize and honor the original people of this place we call North Kawartha. As duly elected representatives, we follow this Indigenous practice of acknowledgement to foster respectful deliberations, thoughtful collaboration, and wise decision making in our service to this community. And with that, we will get into the business here. First item up is disclosure of pecuniary interest. If any uh, member has a, an interest with any of the matters that are proceeding before us, please declare it. Although I'm not aware that anybody has anything. But as I said before, you know the drill. If um, you do have an interest, you do need to declare it or remove yourself from the proceedings. Um, adoption of the agenda. I think there is the change with respect to, we had a, um, a deputation at 945 from our animal control officer, but that is going to be rescheduled. She can't make it, correct? Okay. Um, and I believe that is everything. So can I have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? As amended, okay. Moved by Jim, seconded, moved by Jim Whalen, seconded by Jim O'Shea. All those in favor? that has been approved and we do have a deputation scheduled for 10 a.m which is from our auditors um but until then we are going to get into um some of the reports here and the first item up is the peterborough county report it's been so long <laughs> <laughs> we did have um we had a meeting uh last week where um the county has uh Five out of the eight municipalities have opted in or to continue doing the garbage upload study um, to kind of get figure out costs and uh, information. Um, and what else do we have there? We talked a bit about um, the communal servicing visit that we have, which was really excellent um, in terms of an option. Can I just ask you folks if while we're in the meeting, if you need to talk and you step outside, just because the uh, microphones will pick it up. Thank you. Uh, Jim, did you have anything to add from our? No, there wasn't much on the agenda actually, other than closed session. Yeah. We talked a little bit about um, the reorganization of, um, you know, like, like, well, no, but bringing in like the tourism and all that uh, as well with that uh, Peterborough Economic yeah. Development. We received our last report from Peterborough Economic Development on their activities and uh, and counties working hard to kind of bring all that stuff in house. Um, yeah, it's, I think that's pretty much it. Can't think of anything else that we would have. No, it's pretty, uh, pretty, as I say, closed session. Yeah. And also, too, we did, uh, um, I did ask for a motion to support. There was a letter from, um, I think it was the town of Cochrane, calling on the provincial government to uh, deal with uh, the whole producer responsible responsibility uh, for recycling pickup to eliminate the non eligible sources of recycling. As we know right now, the county is picking up the slack. When it comes to um, CMO, they're only picking up from residential and certain eligible sources, but you know, businesses, institutions, um, schools, all that kind of stuff are not are considered ineligible and are you know having to uh, going to have to look at alternative uh, ways of getting their garbage uh, uh, collected and uh, yeah, pardon me, recycling collected. So uh, we're asking that um, if they're going to. Seriously, if the producers are going to be fully responsible for the recycling, they need to be collecting all of it, not just some of it. So um, that's it, I think, for the county report. Is there any questions or comments on any of that? If not, can I have a motion to receive the county report? Moved by Ruthann, seconded by Colin. All those in favor? That has been received. And Colin. Do you have a report for us from Pro Valley? So, not really. We met yesterday. We had an emergency meeting for closed session, um, but September is our next scheduled meeting, and that's when we're expected to have the flood hazard mapping. Uh, and again, 
the uh, staff are reminded that North Fork should be circulated on that uh, sort of prior to the board discussion. Uh, but again, it, it was just a closed session meeting that we had. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and then adoption of the minutes of the previous meeting of council that was held on July 16th. Any questions, comments, any errors or omissions? And you're going to move to adopt, Jim. Okay. Moved by Jim O'Shea, seconded by Jim Whalen. All those in favor? Those minutes have been adopted. And uh, no business arising from previous minutes. We have a consent agenda with our monthly activity reports. And as you can see, there is the addition. And when we made that recent split between building and planning, we now have an extra report coming forward there, which is great to see. Um, and I know that the Public Works Department will be provided at the uh, the next meeting. And there have we also have a few letters on there, too. Does anybody want to pull anything out to have a discussion on? The only thing I will say, there is a letter from Ambrose Moran with respect to the chain link fence at the Apsley LCBO location, and just that Edward kind of put it into the file when we're looking at uh, the sort of the master plan and, and sort of the downtown improvements, because um, I think that kind of dovetails nicely with the uh, with kind of some of the things that we'll be looking at doing in the future for absolutely. Otherwise, then can I have a motion to receive the consent agenda, please? Made by Ruthann, seconded by Colin. All those in favor? That has been received. Okay, and we're into staff reports requiring action. And the first one is our planning. And uh, Daryl, welcome. And Emily, are you coming up too? <laughs> We've got the, the whole team with us. Um, Daryl is our, 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 our newly, uh, uh, he's the manager of our planning uh, department, our new new planning department, and uh, the senior planner, and Emily is our junior planner, and they're going to present their proposed key planning objectives for this ah. year when they get a battery in for their microphone. <laughs> you may have to turn it on. Yeah, I think it's going to be yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, um, members of council. The report uh, in front of council is intended to um, hopefully outline key uh, draft objectives for the balance of 2014 leading into 2015. Uh, this follows the uh, the earlier creation of a separate planning department. The first objective uh, is simply to enhance the current level of customer service to the members of the public and development community by a number of tasks. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm able to advise council that uh, since uh, early in our great tenure here, um, Emily and I have uh, been successful in establishing um, combined schedules, whereas the uh, counter and presence in the, in the planning office is covered daily by one or the other, and sometimes both. And uh, also, I'm able to advise that uh, uh, with respect to any uh, public inquiries, pre-consultations, anyone coming to the counter or emailing us, um, they are automatically offered an opportunity to meet with us, either virtually or in person um, at their convenience, and we're depending where they are and so on. And we're also promoting the internal review of planning applications wherever possible. Um, uh, internal and external, uh, we're, we're looking at ways to more uh, effectively streamline a picture the external reviews where there seems to be with certain agencies a bit of a disconnect in terms of um, what we require and the timing involved. So we're working at that to, if, if you will, um, better inform those agencies as to what our requirements are and what is stipulated according to the Planning Act. Uh, we're looking at uh, opportunities for simplifying the planning applications and process. Um, as you, council may or may not be aware, certain planning applications um, morph over the passage of time. Um, one municipality looks at another municipality, and if anything, applications tend to grow in terms of the, the depth and width of uh, information they require. And so we're looking at those applications from a critical eye to determine whether or not uh, and to what extent we can eliminate any redundancy. And in other words, are there questions in these applications where we simply don't need that information? If not, why are we asking for it? 
Uh, we're also looking at the opportunity for um, posting, uh, uh, looking at an increased awareness or enhanced awareness of what the planning department is doing, what, why we're here. Uh, we have put a, a through uh, the assistance of the first department, we have posted a, an announcement on the website. We're also looking at things like an old fashioned uh, poster campaign. Uh, we're also looking at uh, uh, doing um, one on ones with the development community, uh, contractors, and designers. In other words, to make them aware of what we require in order for us to help them. The second uh, objective is uh, we're looking at a stakeholder outreach and engagement, particularly with uh, designers, developers, and the construction industry. Whereas uh, we are looking at, again, the website mass family, but we're also looking at uh, uh, hosting roundtable bullpen sessions with, uh, with that group who are more active in construction and development than say the members of the general public and perhaps doing that two to three times a year. And that may um, intertwine with um, our efforts with the zoning bylaw committee. Um, we're also looking at uh, the prospect of looking at uh, arranging meetings, one-on-one -on -one in house meetings with the in, in, individual local developers who have been kind of sitting on the fence or sitting on the fringes, but not quite deciding what to do and how we might be able to assist them in, in uh, either moving their plans forward or having them look at protect, uh, perhaps alternatives to those plans the more easily could be supported from a planning perspective. Uh, as you know, we've uh, since uh, council has since uh, established a um, a bylaw zoning bylaw committee. The members of the committee are listed in the report on the bottom of uh, page two. And as well, we will be relying. The committee will be relying on uh, such. Um, uh, internal departments as public works, building, emergency services, and so on, as specialized uh, um, secondary resources to the committee uh, from time to time. They will also, of course, be integral in the review of the need trap document once we get that far. And finally, the consolidation of zoning bylaw uh, 26 uh, 2013, which is the current zoning bylaw for the municipality is uh, actually already underway. It's in the capable hands of the first department. And uh, we, we believe that that's uh, quite advantageous to not only assist the committee and staff, but also the public while we're preparing a new bylaw. If I could also, um, Madam Mayor, with your permission, we'll just go back to the monthly report for planning. And uh, my apologies, but uh, what appears to be um, dropped, if you will, from the report was the uh, comparison between 2023 and 2024 uh, application activities. Now that will be certainly picked up in subsequent monthly reports. However, I am able to advise council that um, the uh, uh, month of July was relatively light or slow, if you will, hot summer, hot July. Uh, lots of rain, but uh, uh, seeing temperatures and and it could have very well been an indication where people have said, you know what, we're just going to stay at the cottage and enjoy ourselves. We'll think about plans later. And uh, almost to the day, the beginning of August, uh, there was a significant increase uh, uptake in inquiries, pre-cons, and, uh, and uh, actually applications as well. So I have to um, uh, give a shout out to, to Emily and uh, Janet for keeping all those balls in the air because we're expecting a, a pretty busy fall. Thank you. My comments. Okay. Um, you're done there and you- Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, Jim, start us off, please. Um, your, your second uh, or third um, uh, thing under number one, you, um, promoting and streamlining. <laughs> Daryl, I've heard this for 30 years. <laughs> do you really think there's anything we can do 
just streamline it so people uh, don't have as much uh, or much problem uh, getting a building permit or, or whatever. You know, it, it just seems like it's an impossible thing to get going. Have you got any? Well, the uh, certain mayor, the the process uh, over thirty years has not exactly be, uh, been become more simple. It has been complex. The uh, building permit process is more complex, uh, notwithstanding cloud permit. Um, and I'm not not even familiar with that. I just know what I've heard. Um, but the planning process, I believe, uh, has opportunities to not so much um, streamline the process in terms of um, <clears throat> getting approval quicker, but um, what we have in mind is um, as the number of applications come in, um, and with the permission of the the CAO and council, um, rather than wait and bring out planning applications to one meeting per month, it would be our preference to simply keep them moving, bring them forward to, to both um, meetings if that's doable. Because um, if an application is ready to go, but um, we have to wait two weeks to get it on the council agenda, then that's not really uh, expediting the process, in my opinion, uh, depending on, again, on the, the load of uh, the council agenda that is coming up. Uh, secondly, um, uh, we have already had um, initial conversations with one rather prominent external agency, and we've also, um, I'd like to think, been making headway in terms of streamlining stream that process, uh, their process to more readily um, be compatible with ours. So, little steps, um, and you can make, uh, again, through the mirror, in my experience, you can make little steps, and that's fine. It's just making them stick. So most of it's internal then. Between most of it's in here, we can improve it in here rather than um, anything extra. Uh, both. Both. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, and certainly having uh, planning on you know whatever council meeting makes makes sense. We we used to do that, and then there was a change you know a few years ago where we thought well we'll just maybe slot it to the one particular meeting of the month. We've actually had um, you know uh, council meetings where it's been solely on planning when we have a lot of planning and stuff. But yeah, I agree. I think whatever we can do um, to put it on the agenda, and if it makes it for a longer agenda, then so be it, right? But it's important to, to get that through. And uh, I also just wanted to say too, I love the idea of the, uh, the round table sessions. I think that uh, certainly council gets a lot of feedback, and you guys probably do too, but I mean, I think it'd be great to sort of put all those folks together in, in the room and, and sort of talk yeah. about, you know, the, what challenges do you have and what are some of the good things and just kind of you know, develop those best practices, right? That yeah. work for North Fort Worth for sure. Well, you're, you're quite right, Madam Mayor. Um, to hear it from those who go through the process regularly, um, we may think we have a, a near perfect process, but they may have suggestions or, or comments as to why we can make it better. Um, we we know why we we do what we do, but uh, the development community, designers, contractors, and developers um, may not have in, information that we need to do it this way. So there's all kinds of opportunity for interaction that I think is going to benefit on both sides. No, I agree. Um, any other questions or comments, Paul? So our recent service delivery review uh, recommended a sort of permit concierge service um, where people unfamiliar with the service can come in and really get their hand held through the process. Um, and even with the staff time, it was determined that it would be a significant savings because of all the headaches that sort of come through with incomplete applications. Um, is that something that you think is worth investigating? Uh, so the chair, that in fact has already happened. Uh, and since we joined five, six weeks ago, um, and then there's there's one more coming up this week where I will be sitting down with the individual and actually assisting. I can't fill the form on board, but I can I can provide her with guidance, and that's what's going to happen. I'll be very very happy. To get <laughs> well, yeah, no kidding. That's that how huge. Stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, any other questions or comments? 
Well, I do have one. Oh, yeah, go ahead. It's, I think, more for maybe Jim. Do we have a date for the zoning committee? Um, yeah, it's 27th, I think it is. Mm -hmm. I haven't got it in front of me, but I think it's the uh, 27th. Yeah, August through, through, the through, the chair, through the chair, we were shooting for the 27th. However, um, uh, we were advised, I think, by at least one member of the committee that they would not be available. So now we're, we're looking at an alternative date. All right, anything else? Otherwise, uh, excellent report, thank you. Love the uh, objectives and uh, and this is just for this year, so I can't wait to see for next year <laughs> to come up with. But anyway, uh, this is great, thank you both. Um, and I have a motion to receive uh, the report as prepared by the manager planning. Moved by Jim Shea, seconded by Ruthann. All those in favor? Thank you. It's been received, thank you very much. All right, so we're still looking good on time before our next presentation. So we're gonna move on to uh we have parks and recreation and waste oh uh, yeah i carry is not the one for you but oh it may not be any direct question okay well we can certainly do that the first one is the co-op student opportunity for parks and rec something we've done before in the past trusting that everybody has read the reports and any questions or anything? the recommendation? Right. Okay, well, let's read it out just because uh, we didn't we're not have a discussion on it. But at the Township of North Fort, this Parks and Recreation Department participate in a four credit cooperative education program and opportunity for students from Thomas A. Stewart Secondary School from September 2024 to January 2025 at approximately 12 hours weekly. Okay, so you'll move that. And Sorry, second, with a comment, though. Absolutely. Uh, one very minor change that I think we should make, and they did a good job being neutral through the entire report. Um, but at the end of the first paragraph of analysis, we have this will provide him with some exposure <laughs> to the intricacies of facility operations and maintenance. Um, and I think it could be or him or her that we hire. <laughs> narrowed it down, didn't it? Like a, a minor thing, but I think it's worth updating. Absolutely. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think the one that we've been approached to take on is <laughs> okay. So it's already in the works. So it's, so it's accurate. But yeah, in the future, yes, we're going to try to keep it, yeah, neutral for sure. Okay. All right. Um, so there's a motion on the floor, duly seconded. All those in favor? That is approved. Okay. And the next one, we have Gary's been talking about this a lot. <laughs> This has been a challenge for sure, but it looks like I think we've got the fix in. Um, it's just a struggle with as I said, the snow. It's the it's regarding the snow melt, pit heating, piping, emergency replacement. And as I said, there's been lots of discussion, but there is a recommendation here that the Township of North Fort the transfer forty four thousand four hundred sixty five dollars from general reserves to cover the cost. Excuse me, of replacing the supply and return piping to the NKCC snow melt pit heating coil. And the township transfer a further approximate 7500 from general reserves for incidentals on this project including flat roof penetration flashing and ceiling so that is the motion there and it looks like that's really going to kind of solve the problem we're going to get it out from the floor and get it above ground and, and accessible so in the future if there's issues or problems um it'll be much easier to uh, to discover and diagnose for sure all right, so any questions or comments? Otherwise, somebody wants to move their um, recommendation. Perfect, thank you for that. Is there a second for that? Seconded by Ruthann again. All those in favor? That has been approved. Okay, and now we are on to finance and we have second quarter financial activities and our treasurer here, as well as our deputy treasurer. Uh, but just Judy's coming forward, you get to... <laughs> no, 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 not Diane. Diane, Diane I'll, I'll, I'll be your support. Yeah, <laughs> she's like a back. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Judy, and uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good morning, everybody. Which is not one work? You can put. You can. We just gotta hit the button. Just look. There you go. <laughs> Last time I did that, and I was told, no, you don't do that. You, <laughs> you guys change the rules all the time. <laughs> so, okay, second uh, quarter financials, basically, um, of course, I don't have my crystal ball handy again, but, you know, talk to the managers, and we're looking good so far. I did notice a couple, or mention a couple of possible anomalies. Um, 
they may correct themselves or find someplace else um, by the end of the year if we're underspent someplace or something. But right now we're looking at possibly, you know, coming out even, no major deficit or surplus by the end of the year. Hopefully more uh, detailed information in September. We have a better idea at that point what we're looking at. Okay, so is there any questions or, or comments? Well, certainly, like you said, in terms of, um, we just have the report from the planner about how it's kind of slow, but now it's picking back up. So that may have an impact on what we've budgeted in, in that specific department, right? So. Right, and yep. sorry, and, and also the Carson Rec uh, report where, yes, we're looking at this extra expense, but we're saying we're going to transfer from reserves. So it'll be in that zero right. difference. Right, exactly, so, okay. All right, um, any questions or comments for GE on that? There's the, we've got three reports underneath there, but then we've got the, the spreadsheets with the breakdown when it comes to the salaries, the wages and benefits, as well as uh, um, uh, just the financial activities by department as well too. So any questions or comments on that? Just, just one, because I'm fine. Sure. Um, um, Judy, um, the total municipal and non-municipal uh, net taxation, um, $3,800,824,000. Is that, is that about in line with last year or is that? Uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> if I may, that 3 million is estimated to the year end. So when you add all of that together, then we're looking at a zero net possibly. Okay. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? Um, there is a recommended motion that council pass a motion to receive the financial activities report and the salaries and benefits breakdown report for the 2024 second quarter as prepared by the treasurer. Who would like, Jim O'Shea would like to move that seconder. All of them second that. All of those in favor? That. All right. Thanks very much. Okay. And I'm looking at the time, 9.57. And I see, I think Joanna Park is here from Baker Tilly, correct? Yeah. I think what and it's scheduled for, for 10 a.m., but we're doing good and she's here already. So why don't we uh why don't we bring you in, Joanna, and you can give us the uh report for uh the auditor's uh um report for um our municipality as of December 31st, 2022. Good morning, Joanna, and uh welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me okay? I was having yes, we can issues before. Okay, perfect. Um, I don't think I've met most of you. I am Joanna Park. I am Richard Stiginga's partner. Um, he and Veronica are both, uh, you know, scheduled vacation at this time. So they both apologize for not being there. But uh, I am a municipal partner as well. So uh, I should, I, although I've never had the pleasure of working on your municipality, I'm very familiar with, uh, with lots of your neighbors. So I will walk through the presentation that they've prepared for you and I have the file up. So if anyone has any questions, uh, I can do my best. And if not, I'm sure they'll be happy to get back to you. Um, as you mentioned, we are here presenting the December 31st, 2022 financial statements. Um, what this package is, is it's a summary of the other items that you have in your agenda package. You have your financial statements and your letter uh, kind of post audit letter. This is kind of a summary of the highlights of those packages, but of course, I'm happy to address any items that are there. If you can just go back one slide, we'll start with the auditor's report. So this is what you've really engaged us for is the auditor's report. Um, it is two pages long attached to your financial statements, but this is the kind of the primary paragraph. This is what you really want to see. And it says, in our opinion, the accompanying consolidated financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the township at December 31st, 2022. And they are in accordance with Canadian public sector accounting standards, which you as a municipality have to um, abide by. So that is a clean auditor's opinion. That's what you as council members and uh, ratepayers would want to see. On the next slide, we're required to let you know what we do as part of our audit. We review council minutes, uh, the closed and the open sessions to make sure that anything financial um, is reflected appropriately in the financial statements. We do lots of testing, sampling, analytical review. We look at management's estimates to make sure it's reasonable. And then we do systems documentation and related control testing on your main systems, the money coming in and the money coming out. 
On the next slide, we talk about uh, the audit is complete pending council's approval of the financial statements. And then once that's done, when we ask management to sign a representation letter and we um, also get uh, confirmation from the lawyers that there's nothing outstanding that should be reflected in the financial statements. There was no changes in our initial audit plan. We didn't have to audit things differently. We had no disagreements or difficulties with management and staff. Um, as, as I've always understood that that's the case. It's always a pleasure, I think, to work on the audit um, of North Gortha. Um, the one thing I will note is just with the change in the conversion to the t uh, tangible capital asset module, that is kind of the cause for the delay and why we're just looking at 2022 statements now. But it's my understanding that the 2023 audit is already underway and you will have uh, some of our team there uh, there shortly. There is one uncorrected audit difference, which has been there in the past, and that's just payroll uh, accrual. So at the end of the year, um, the, your first pay in January always um, includes some of the December, uh, the prior year's uh, payroll. So that hasn't historically been recorded, but it's re we're required to let you know that there is that amount of just under $32,000. It doesn't change our audit opinion. We still feel the statements are um, materially representative of the financial position. Then we get into the numbers. So we've taken kind of the snapshots of your financial statements and kind of put them into a little more bite-sized pieces that are a little easier to hopefully understand. So with your financial assets, these are your cash and your investments and your other assets that you can easily convert into cash. Um, you'll see a lot of change there this year. Um, in 2021, uh, you had nine point, almost $9.6 million in cash. It's dropped down to $5.7 million in 2022. But now you have uh, $3 million in GICs. So when you look at the total, you're now in cash and investments about $8.8 million, and your actual um, cash in the prior year, $9.5 million. So not quite the drop it looks like. Your accounts receivable, at the end of 2022, you had a lot of projects going on, including the Mount Julian Road project. So you're going to see that throughout uh, the statements. And at the end of 2022, there was a lot of funding outstanding, about almost $1.9 million. So of that 2.6 million, uh, 1.9 of that is just uh, the funding for that uh, project. And taxes receivable, 568,000. One thing the province looks at is they look at the total of your receivables um, compared to as a percentage of your total levy, your total amount uh, that you're uh, billing, whether it be county and uh, school boards and, and your township portion. So their recommended guideline is 10% of that you're sitting at 4% right now. So staff definitely need to be commended for their efforts in collecting the taxes receivable and the prior year was no different, uh, 4%. So that is a great percentage to be at, uh, less than half of the ministry recommend uh, recommendation. The next slide just shows kind of the graphical representation of those numbers and you see 2022 much different. The green bar uh, going down, and that's because the cash is now, some of the cash has been put into investments, and then you have that large receivable. On the next slide, is anyone talking? I can hear talking, but I'm not sure if they're. Yeah, you know what? I'm just wondering. Yeah, we just, there's some people that are outside in the hallway that are speaking, oh. and I just, just hang on one second. We're going to ask them to step outside. Oh, Mike is picking it up. It sounds like it. Well, I was I was actually sending a message to <laughs> to Bree to say, hey, ask them to step out. I just wanted to make sure no one was trying to ask me a question and I, I was just carrying on. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. It's just as I said, it's just it's not the most soundproof room, unfortunately. So it's uh it's hard as always having just a regular conversation in the hall if you can hear it through the door. So Everyone. but anyway, go ahead. You're you're fine. Perfect, thank you. Um, under your financial liabilities, the amounts owing or the amounts you have on hand at the end of the year, accounts payable and accrued liabilities, that's all your invoices, um, anything relating to the 2022 period that just hadn't been paid at the end of 2022, um, large increase there. And again, that's due to the capital projects. You had, uh, you know, holdbacks, you had uh, invoices outstanding at the end of the year of um, amounting to that large increase there. Your obligatory reserve funds, $120,000. 87,000 of that is your gas tax or your Canada Community Building Fund as it's known now, and 32,000 being your parkland fees. So that's amount 120,000 that you can use for future projects. 
And the same with your deferred revenue other, 317,000. That's revenue you've received that you haven't spent and that you can use in future years. Um, there's a whole lot of different pot, pots of money there. There's the electric car charge of $50,000 money uh, funds that you got, your OCIF funding of 122,000 that hadn't been spent and some COVID relief funding in there as well. So lots of different pots of money there. And they're more disclosed in the financial statement. Your landfill closure and post-closure liability, 686,000. That's the amount um, related to how much it's going to cost to continue monitoring your eight closed sites um, until the end of the monitoring time. And then the employee future liability, that's the estimate of how much it it's going to cost in the future um, for the benefits that the employees get once they retire. Uh, so your total liability is $3.5 million. And then we can see on the graph there, the, uh, just the trend. And obviously, uh, you can go to the next slide. Thank you for whoever's controlling. Um, the accounts payable, that big blue line, that's the large amount just due to the capital projects uh, that were going on at the end of the year. Then we look at your net financial assets on the next slide. So that's your financial, yeah, your financial assets minus your liabilities. Um, and you can see the nice trend there, very positive there, uh, just a little decrease this year, but not much. You're, you're hovering around that $8.4 million, very, uh, very positive balance there. And then looking at your non-financial assets. So these are the assets that you can't uh, easily convert into cash and your tangible capital assets being the largest ones. So that's your, the amount of the historical cost of those assets minus the um, accumulated amortization or um, because they get expensed over their useful life. So an increase there, you had $3.6 million in capital additions during the year, which we'll see in a, a later slide, uh, minus the amortization or the expensing of those assets of $1.16 million to give you that increase there. And then you do have a little bit of prepaid expenses, 136,000, that's the amount paid in 2022, most of it insurance relating to the 2023 period. And on the next slide, we see the capital asset additions. So we talked about how you had about uh, $3.6 million in capital additions. A lot of those in roads and bridges, the Mount Julian uh, via Mead Road was 2.6 million of that, uh, three, almost 3.2 million in roads and bridges. Um, this is a couple of years ago, so I'm just reminding you, uh, your buildings, you had improvements to the health center, Glen Alda Community Center and the Sand Dome. You had lots of pick up, a few pickup tr trucks um, purchased during the year and some machinery and equipment, including some furnishings um, at the library and various township equipment as well. And this is a good slide to look at. We kind of use this as a snapshot and I think five years is probably the appropriate amount. Um, looking at how fast you're replacing your uh, capital versus your amortization. The amortization is done on a historical cost. Um, so you want to make sure and it's not going to happen every year, but you want to make sure on average that you're replacing those assets at a greater amount of the amortization. As we all know, everything's costing more and more these days. So if you were only replacing your assets at the same rate as your amortization, you'd quickly fall into more of that capital deficit uh, as uh, that term gets thrown around a lot uh, these days. So you can see, obviously, in 2022, 2021, you were doing a lot more than your amortization. And I suspect the same in 2023 when we see those numbers. And then your accumulated surplus. So in total, you have um, just under $36 million or $35.5 million in accumulated surplus. Most of that has already been spent. You've invested in capital assets at the $27 million. And you don't have any debt on those assets. Um, that's the one thing we didn't talk about. There's no debt in your financial statement. So $27 million has been invested in the assets. Um, under the surplus, then we remove the employee future benefits and the unfunded landfill costs because those are amounts that you're going to fund as you incur those costs. You don't have to fund them. You don't have to take them out of your surplus at the time being. And then your reserves, $9.3 million, an increase of $35,000 during the year. You did use lots of reserves during the year, but then you overall you had a $208,000 um, operating surplus, which then got transferred into the reserve. So it kind of, you know, what you took out, you were able to put back in, which kind of worked out well in your favor to give you that accumulated surplus of $35.5 million. And then just looking at the trend of your reserves over the years, you can see there's a nice kind of increase in, in reserves. 
um, the one thing I often get asked is, you know, do we have enough reserves? Is this enough? And uh, um, my kind of answer there is it really depends on your asset management plan. You need to be looking at that. Uh, I think this is a big reason why the province is pushing this is to make sure that you're looking at it and seeing what you're gonna to need to do down the road and therefore kind of making a plan to make sure that you have the funds on hand um, when you need those expenses. And then a snapshot of your consolidated statement of operations. So there's a lot of numbers here. I'm really just gonna tell you the purpose of the statement. The top part is to show you your total revenue and expenses and your PSAB annual surplus. So in 2022, your PSAB annual surplus was 2.3 uh, million dollars. You'll notice in your budget, it says almost $1.9 million as the uh, budgeted annual surplus. And I know council didn't budget for a $1.9 million uh, surplus. I don't, uh, you know, we've already talked. I don't do a lot with you, but I know you didn't budget for that. And what the second part of that slide um, is, is it showing, um, oh, can you go back? Sorry. It's showing um, the items that how you budget versus how we have to prepare the statements. They're different. Um, and it's not a, a way of how you're budgeting. It's not wrong. You're budgeting appropriately. You're budgeting for capital. When you purchase capital, you need to raise the funds at that time. But when we look at the financial statements, the capital is being expensed over the useful life. So what this does is it shows the amortization, the purchase of capital assets, and the transfers to and from reserves and how they're not reflected in the financial statements the same way as your budget. Um, but the idea there is when you could see those zeros at the bottom, that's actually what you budgeted for. Um, I'm sure council feels a little more better, a little better to see that zero. Um, and then your operating surplus in 2022 as well as 2021 was zero. So um, that it's really just the difference between how you budget versus how we have to show the financial statements. The one thing I will show there is your budgeted in 2022 was uh, just under $4.1 million in tangible capital assets. Actual is 3.6, that's just a representative of kind of the projects, you know, were a little um, not done as far as you had expected at the end of 2022. So you can see those numbers. Uh, it's really the only place in the slides that you kind of see that, uh, that comparison there. And then the transfers to and from reserves in the last two lines. And then the next slide just shows the representation of the revenue versus the expenses. And you can see in 2022, you had a lot of capital revenue, which gets all um, recorded in the year you receive it or in the year you spend it. But of course, it's for capital. So the expense of that isn't being represented or recognized until over the useful life. So that's why you see that gap between revenue and expenses during the year. And now to show the actual um, revenue, 11, just over $11 million in actual revenue in 2022, the largest being your property taxation of 6,169,000. You had user charges of uh, 1,057,000. Um, one thing, again, to keep in mind, 2021, when you're comparing it to that, there was still a lot of COVID closures in 2021. There was still a little bit in 2022 as well, um, but that's really why you see that change there in the user charges, especially. In the government of Canada, $1.2 million, um, 1 1.1, almost 1.2, almost the full amount of that is your ICIP uh, funding for the Mount Julian uh, road project. And then the same in province of Ontario, the $2 million, uh, 600, uh, 982,000 or almost half of that is your own PF funding. And then 662,000 of that as well is your ICIP funding for Mount Julian. So that's why you see those increases in your government of Canada and your province of Ontario funding is, is the capital projects that were underway. Uh, other things to note there, your penalties and interest on taxes, 103,000 um, under the prior year end budget. But of course, the, uh, the good side of that is you actually have the cash in the bank. Your, your, uh, or your uh, taxes receivable are quite uh, low. So that's why you see the decrease there. And then investment income and donations uh, increase there um, with the increase in the interest rates as well. And then the Canada Community Building Fund earned 153,000. That's what you actually spent. Um, the amount remaining we talked about is in the obligatory reserve fund. And then looking at the pie chart, just where your money is coming from, even with that large capital project, 56% of your total revenue is still property taxation, and then 18 from the province and 11% from the, uh, the feds. 
And then we're required to show expenses two ways. This is the first way by uh, kind of departments, if you will. Um, the total budget of your expenses was just under $8.8 .8 million. The actual was $8.6 million. Um, really, the only big variance there when you look year over year is in the recreation and cultural services, of course, because of the um, increase from prior year because of the um, more COVID closures during 2021 versus 2022. And then looking at uh, kind of the pie chart of the departments there, protection services being your largest and transportation services being the second and kind of as expected there in, in a similar municipality. And then seeing expenses, the same numbers at the bottom as we saw on the previous slide, but then more broken into the type of expenses. So your salaries and benefits, your materials, contracted services. And then the amortization, of course, uh, being your non-cash expense. And 39.6% of your expenses are salary and benefits, 28% in materials, and then contracted services rounding out the top three. And that is my presentation. Are there any questions? Awesome. <laughs> Good job. Well, bottom line is we're doing okay. Great. Right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good. Now, unless you tell me, though, that you have a, you know, $10 million road and bridge project, then then you might have to reconsider. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. No, <laughs> Um, any questions or comments, uh, Colin, start us off. Uh, just for clarification, and under the difficulties encountered during the audit, uh, the letter of engagement was set March 24th. Uh, was the software update done after March 24th, or was this an issue that happened before the engagement of the audit? I believe it was done, and I know your treasurer is there, so I might have to refer to her, but uh, I believe it was done kind of at the same time as we were starting the audit, but I will uh, refer to your treasurer on that. Judy, did you want to add to that? Yeah. So, yeah, it might have been around that time. Um, it took a while to get the assets and the amortization, the amortization and everything figured out and calculated in there properly. It did take a while, but by that time, to in order to um, book the the auditors, they were booked up quite a bit. So then you're looking at I think it was July when they completed when they um, actually finished the the 22 audit. But it was they didn't want to be booked, and I understand it until we had all of that figured out with the new program. And um, once that was done, then it's like okay, to find their time then, because they were already booked in other municipalities, it was going to be July until they could actually finish finish our audit. So that's why the big difference. Yep. So if the software was purchased or the issues arose at the time of the letter of engagement or around then, I'm wondering why that letter of engagement was sent 18 months after the last one. Uh, these should be sort of done every 12 months and at this point, we're so far behind that in order to get these documents before budget, which makes them way, way more valuable, we'd have to be two months ahead until 2029. And that council would be able to sort of have this presentation um, in time for budget. That, that's that's how far behind we are right now. Well, I believe, um, and I can't, I just, there was a letter I did receive from, from Richard T. And it sent me a note, just a heads up that you were coming to to present. But I believe the auditors are starting next week. Um, to do the 2023, and my expectation is that we will get that this fall, hopefully, and prior to the budget. Or, yeah. I would hope so. Yeah, if, um, unless we come across any problems, yeah, there's no reason why we can't um, do the audit and be done, and and hopefully you'll see Richard in a, in a few months. Yeah. Okay, Judy. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, and I am pushing. <laughs> I don't know if it'll happen, but with hopefully it'll be all wrapped up. Um, next week, except for the amortization, which does take, it's very, it's the very end and it takes a little bit of time. Um, but I have put out the idea of having you presented at the last meeting in September. I'm hoping we'll meet that. It might be the first meeting in October. I'm, I'm hoping for that. So we're going to get back on track for sure. Okay. Yes, sir. And I, I really hope that we can, but I just have a hard time seeing how we can go from 18 months behind to 
directly on time within two or three months. Like, Go ahead, Judith. Yep. So it was the implementation of citywide. So we started implementing it and um, we run into problems. We didn't, we really didn't think it would take that long for it to be up and running and to the point where we could use it for the amortization. Hindsight is great. And, and this is on me, this is my fault. If I had have said, let's do the amortization as we always have in Great Plains, it would have been sooner. As we were going along with the implementation, it would be, you know, we get where, okay, we're almost there. Okay, let's, let's get there. We just have to do this duty or this task. It'll be ready. We would get to that task, something else. We'd, we'd run into another hurdle. So then it's another couple of weeks delay or whatever. Um, and yes, I should have said at some point, okay, enough is enough. But we were so far in, it's like, let's just finish it, get it in citywide, and it'll be there ready. So that's on me that, that we do. It's sort of two separate software issues. There were the software issues experienced during the audit and software issues that complicated and led to that engagement letter being sent in March, 2024. I'm not sure if there was a software issue during the audit. Um, it was to get it there for the, it's the amortization. So to get all of the assets into the citywide program, get it balanced. We were back and forth with the auditors and making sure they were the figures that were balancing with them. Um, and then they started the audit after that. All right, so, uh, but like I said, it, it does look like we're, we're going to be catch, catching up and we'll be uh, on track. We have that information prior to our budget deliberations. Yeah. Yes, and I found my crystal ball and <laughs> we will. <laughs> so for next year, we'll go back to where we used to be consistently every year. Our audit would be in March and the statements would be presented in usually July. So for 24, they should be presented next. I will see July. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments on the presentation? Well, I think uh, that was great. And like I said, the bottom line is we, we look good and here's continuing, <laughs> hoping that we continue to look good. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Joanna, for your presentation. And can I have a motion to um, receive the presentation and further, hang on, I've got a motion now. I can get to it. Uh, that we receive the presentation and that the auditor's engagement letter be approved for signature by two members of council. Can somebody move that, please? Moved by Jim O'Shea, seconded by Jim Whalen. All those in favor? That is approved. Thanks very much. Oh, sorry. Sorry, can I just, I have yeah. these. Um, Thank you very much. Um, but the one thing I wanted to say, but just to point out, and uh, Joanna did mention about the 4% tax receivable. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's hard work. That's yeah. Diana working with the rate payers to bring their accounts up to date or as much as possible. And uh, she's done a fabulous job. We used to be, <clears throat> excuse me, we used to be usually between six, 7% came down a little bit and it's moved up to four, two years in a row. So just kudos to uh, to our deputy treasurer. Kudos, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I see when we look at the taxes receivable and how high it was in 2020 and how much we've come down. So good work. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, um, I think that's it. You know what? Uh, I'm going to actually call for a recess and uh, we'll resume back at 10.35 if everybody has time.